Hello, everyone. Welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. My name is Lana Coley, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this exciting production of Pedro Calderón de la Barca's El Monstro de los Jardines, The Monster in the Garden, with the translation by Caridad Svich. Today, I'm joined by Francisco Berenachea from the University of Maryland College Park, and he'll be giving us some insight into this, uh, this play that was that's totally unknown to English speakers like myself. Uh, but before I turn to him, I want to introduce this amazing cast we have today, directed by Carlos Bellato. Our featured actors include Aldo Bringas, Carlos Bellato, Elizabeth Lambert, Hera Luo, Hugo Luna, Alejandro Mitre, Arancha Olortegui, and Andrea Padilla. Um, so I'm so excited to see all of them grace our stage. Francisco, I had never heard of this play until, until I heard that we were going to be featuring it in this series. So what, what can you tell us about it? Well, the first thing I can tell you, Lana, I, first of all, thank you for inviting me over to uh, talk about this play. I'm a big fan of Calderon, not an expert, but a fan. So um, as any other fan, I would just basically be spouting my fanness when it comes to talking about this. But uh, a few things about this play. Uh, you're not alone, basically. A lot of even the educated theater public in uh, the English speaking world knows very little about Calderon. Uh, whereas, for example, if you go to uh, Latin America and Spain, I mean, Calderon productions are still going on, actually, every year after year after year, there's a production by Calderon. So it's the playwright that still is alive within um, the Spanish-speaking world. But in the States, you know, I remember reading a theater review of um, Life is a Dream, which is, might be the most well-known play of Calderon, and uh, talking about him as a revelation. So, I mean, the revelation to whom? To you, perhaps. But, I mean, everybody else, like, you know, that Spanish-speaking world is, like, you know, rolling their eyes, you know. But anyway, but that is... Uh, Typical situation, you often also find him being referred to as the as Spain's Shakespeare, which is actually also an extremely bad way to approach him because it sets you up for disappointment because you will not be getting Shakespearean drama. What you're going to see on the stage now. he The play that we're going to see, The Monster in the Garden, is from 1650. And um, another thing about this play that you need to, need to take into account is... Uh, I want you first of all, actually, no, I won't be talking about the details. I want you first to look at it, to look at this play. And uh, again, do not think that this is Shakespeare or Racine or any other of the great playwrights of the you know, early modern period. This is something unique. And uh, hopefully when you watch this, you'll be able to glean some of the things that make it kind of unique. And I'll be talking about that more later as we get into the production. Wonderful, thank you so much. Well, let's, let's take a look. Vira el mar. Es inútil la porfía porque el viento que corre es travesía. Amaina a la mayor, isa el trinquete, a la drisa, a la escoca, al chafaldete. Del esquife en la playa y el príncipe no más a tierra vaya, ya que abismos de hielo nos encubren. Piedad, dioses, piedad, cielos. Piedad, dioses, piedad, cielos. Livio, me alegra que estés vivo, mi buen hombre. A mí también. No hay nada aquí más que plantas salvajes y el sonido de las aves. Oh, woe oh, is me. I am so melancholy. ¿Escuchaste a alguien? Sí, un lamento. Vienen aquellas piedras. Silencio. Este lugar no está abandonado. No solo escucho lamentos, también cantos. Señor, ¿existen lugares donde la gente no llora o cante? Oh, woe is me. How melancholy. 
Que los dioses me ayuden. Who is this? I see. Dante. Beso tus pies, Lidoro. Livio, you're here as well. Tu sombra no, me queda, no se queda corto, ¿eh? ¿De qué hablas? Dime, querido Dante, ¿qué es este reino de cenizas al que hemos llegado? Antes de que esta isla fuera solo una piedra solitaria en aguas poco profundas, un joven príncipe llamado Peleo vivía aquí. A young prince called Peleos lived here. Este joven príncipe tenía tal deseo por Tetis, la gloriosa ninfa del mar que se forzó sobre ella. Taking with his desire for Tetis, forced himself upon her. Tetis, ofendida por las acciones de Peleo, destruyó e incendió la isla hasta que no quedó nada. Since that day, it is said that in the caverns, in the cavities between those rocks, are heard the lamentations of human voices, torn by misery and anxiety. Veo un templo en el corazón de la montaña. Mars Temple, King Licomedes, de Idamia, su hija, y Ulises están ahí orando al oráculo. ¿Será esta deidad mía la misma deidad mía que robó mis sentimientos y me llevó a zarpar en el peor momento porque tenía que estar a su lado? Si esto es cierto, si es deidad mía de quien ya estoy comprometido, entonces la fortuna es mía. Indeed it is she. Todo lo que tienes que hacer es venir conmigo y hablar con el rey and she will be your wife. No puedo. No es prudente que mi amor me vea en este estado destrozado y empobrecido. Sí, tiene razón. Te ves uh, fatal. Sí, ¿qué harás, Lidoro? Llámame con otro nombre. Usaré un disfraz. Le escribiré a mi padre para que nos apoye en su debido tiempo. Me presentaré ante de Endamía con la dignidad que ella merece. No sooner did I enter the temple than Mars, than these words were heard. Troy will be destroyed and burned to bits by the Greeks, if Achilles seeks his conquest and lays Hector to rest. Achilles, the wondrous human monster, lives in these mountains. Our mouth that keeps here. And and on his shoulders rests the destruction of Troy. Let us search far and wide for him. Let us not cease in our seeking. If a foreigner, dear sir, a, a stranger to these parts may speak. Termina aquí, naufrago e ignorante de esta tierra. No vi nada durante un largo tiempo, pero sí escuché lamentos humanos cerca de la Thank you, kind man, and lead me to this place because without doubt, the wondrous being, the monster Achilles, is hiding here. I should be the one to go. I will not allow it. It is rough to rain, daughter. The soles of your feet will be ruined. I beg you, stay here. Obey your father. Oh, hermosa deida mía. Más hermosa que en mis sueños. To the ridge. To the summit. To the mountain. La cresta. A la cima. A la montaña. Oh, these skies are so unjust. With such woes as I have. Why must he add grief to mine? ¿Por qué lloras? How can you ask me such a question? Have you forgotten that my father, tyrant of my desires, is trying to marry me off, knowing full well that I find men a great bore? There has never been anyone who has been worthy of my design. How can I let a man call himself owner of my being? How can I let a man behave as if he were my conqueror before even giving me his affection? Mm, malos pensamientos. Mejor sacarlos de tu mente que tenerles. Ven, descansa un poco. Yo te arrullaré.
Desdichado del que no vive engañado. ¿Qué importa si oyendo estoy? Ni sé tu agrado amoroso que tú no me hagas dichoso. Si yo pienso que lo soy, crédito al semblante doy. Aunque me mienta el semblante, pues ya vivo aquel instante en que me miente tu agrado. Desdichado del que no vive engañado. Sweet voice warms my ear. What new bird is this? I have been ignorant of this sound my whole life. I have lived my entire life locked up in this crypt like cave without ever seeing the pure light of day, without ever knowing what is the sky or the fields. The deity who raised me here and who comes to see me at night has ordered me to not go out during daylight. And although I have been obedient thus far, this unique song forces me to break with her command. I rise out of the grotto in hopes that it will perhaps sing again. Sweet voice, what a gentle voice. Shh, sleep, sweet lady Mia. Let's cancel. The sun's pure light blinds me. I'm so eager to see the light of day that I'm faced with darkness. ¡Qué variedad! ¡Qué hermosura tan admirable! Y si creo en mis noticias, no veo cosa como ella sea. ¡Ay! ¡Cuánto finge la idea! ¡Ay! ¡Cuánto huele el deseo! Aquel resplandor, el cielo debe ser. La tierra, a mi parecer, se ve este hermoso, ¿verdad? Este árbol, esta flor, a de esta, esta transparente fuente, a aquel mar. Oh, everything I have seen so far, this is more real than anything else. This is the best of them all. Oh, the eye loves what it sees. If you are not a god, then there are no gods. For I know nothing else. Maldito monstruo! Fu fu fuera! Why do you call me thus? Lárgate en este momento. Do I frighten you so? Listen, don't run. Stay. If I stay here with you, I'm dead. Que Dios me proteja. What is this? What voices do I hear? Do not be frightened by what you see. I only wish to know when you were lying there, lifeless. How is it now that you are with life before me? When you are only an icy statue now, you breathe. Tell me, how can this be? And tell me, if, if I were to walk alongside you, could I embrace your soul and thus forever be with you? Your wild aspect turns fear to horror. Your reasoning is not rational, even if your voices speak a reason. My quick mind dares to judge, and not in vain, that you are a man, a human being. Your soul imagines like a tyrant. I think of you as divine, and you think of me as mortal. I am the son of a goddess. How do you mean? 
It is cruel of you to ask me. What are you? A woman. Such a sweet word. Woman. God indeed must be alive if you made such beautiful animals as woman. Your beauty delights me. It gives me passion. M Mr. Miss Monster, uh, there is, uh, I must confess, much to say about what's going to happen, but I'm not up for it. And run away, senora. I cannot move. Fear has shackled me. Why do you she flee from me thus? I would not be so alone if you offered me your company. No, no, do not draw near. Go another way. Do not run from me. Stay. Wait. Rápido, they damn yes in the arms of a monster. What are these voices I hear? My people, they will kill you. It is in vain to fight the great Achilles. What do you say? You are Achilles? This much I do know. I will detain you now. What good will it do you? Is there no one who can hear me? Monstro maldito! Don't kill him! This is Achilles! Que dijiste? Rage arises in my chest to see her embrace him. I almost hate her now, and before I loved him. No te tengo miedo, pero tus palabras me detienen. No te mataré. Do not hold him thus. Break away now. Let's see if you kills with words can kill with arms. Are you Achilles? I am. Las deidades sagradas han decretado que tú serás the one who will give Greece vengeance from Troy. I want to be your amigo. I do not wish to be yours. It is infamy to be a friend with your tongue and an enemy with your soul. Why enemy? I don't know. What reason have I given you to feel thus? I know the reason, even if I cannot name it. Well, it's my luck to capture you, and so the quarrel must stop. Come with me. That is not possible. Why not? Because the deity whom I live for will miss me when she discovers I am not in the prison from which I have broken from. Goodbye. Espera. It is not possible. The wind itself must have given him wings. How quickly he disappears into the mountain. Hi, well, welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. I'm a little late, but I'm still Joel Christensen from Brandeis University. And we just saw the first scene from El Monstro de la Jardines. Um, Francisco, nice to see you again. How are hey, you doing today? Doing good. Um, so I, I really am um, grateful to you for bringing some Calderon to us because I know so little about his work um, and this play is just really fascinating. Um, so I, I have a bunch of questions for you and we'll see how many of them um, you don't think are ridiculous. Um, but let's start out with sort of the, the background of this play. Where are we in, in the Trojan War cycle? So that's sort of one. And two, um, why would this have been of interest to Calderon's audiences? Well, we are in the episode of, uh, of Achilles Iskiros, where basically Titus tried to hide him in order not to get him to go to the Trojan War, which is a very important element for the Calderonian um, version of the play. And uh, why would the audience of uh, 17th century Spain would be interested in this? Um, the theater in Spain at this point was mass entertainment. All playwrights were ransacking every single historical episode, every single myth and story you can imagine in order to create stories for this, you know, hungry audience that was looking for new material at the time. So myth is as good as any for, uh, for, for them. But uh, for Calderon especially, he is doing something more. And we can talk about that later when it comes to this story of the myth, this, this episode of the myth of Achilles. So I, 
when I'm reading this version of the myth of Achilles, it's mm -hmm. very different from the story I tell my myth class, right? When I tell my myth class, I just say, well, you know, Achilles was hidden in Skyros. Eventually Odysseus came and he tricked him um, by, you know, putting presents out and blowing a, tr a trumpet and Achilles mm -hmm. grabs the spear and shield or sword and shield because, you know, he's a manly man, even though he's beautiful. Right. Yeah. Um, and somewhere along the way, we find out that he, uh, you know, slept with the princess. And this is really important because his son, Neoptolemus, is critical in later narratives. Mm -hmm. But this story um, that Calderon tells us, um, it, it draws on later traditions than that a bit. Right. The, this romance theme um, is, is interesting. Uh, what what other genres or influences might the playwright have been drawing? on? I think in general, you know, um, if you can think about certain influences, one of them, for example, would be Statius, I think, when it comes to the uh, his own poem. I mean, the I think, I mean, in my view, the idea of the monster itself, this creature from rusticity who comes out of the wilderness and begins to discover the world, has a lot to do with that sort of first presentation in, um, in, in the Statius Achilles about the fact that, you know, Achilles is being educated by the centaur Chiron. So it's connected to those things. But uh, one thing we cannot forget is that Calderon, is an extremely fertile creative mind. He really does not follow tradition. He shapes it for his own uh, will in a sense. He really is recrafting constantly. So, I mean, uh, to talk about sources is something that we can do, but in general, you know, you'll find that he basically easily shakes off the shackles of tradition of whatever you want to call that in order to create something entirely new all the time. Well, that's, that's the sense I was getting, because in some of this, I'm hearing, you know, a, a little bit of, you know, Italian romance, right, as well, you know, some Ariosto in there, um, a, a, and a lot less sort of Homer and, and sort of Zopic. It's a, it's a, this is what is called the Comedia in Spanish. Um, it's uh, all this genre is called, they, it's a specific name for this genre in the Spanish theater. It's called the Comedia genre, a genre that's very difficult to define. The best way to define it is basically it's a it's like a blender that you know they just put everything in that the audience would love and they just mix it. Actually, the one of the greater great inventors or developers of this genre called Lope de Vega, another great um, rival, um, I don't know if it's rival, but actually a contemporary of uh, Calderon himself, um, a little bit older. He basically talks about the fact that you know when it comes to writing my dramas, the comedias, I just take Aristotle and I take Horace and I put them at the you know, in the trash can. I just put them <laughs> in the back door. I don't, I don't care about that. Seriously, I can write that, but I don't care. I mean, I kind of give people what they want. And that's basically, it's entertaining. It's meant to entertain and to entice um, and to just to keep the attention of all this like massive audience of people who are basically just there to watch all these plays. They're normally, they often produce one different play each day. So wait, you can imagine- Let's slow down there. Wait, so wait, <laughs> we're doing yeah. one play a day like this? Often. So, I mean- for example, in Mexico in the 18th century, where you still have this sort of theatrical tradition in place, they were doing one play a day. So it's, uh, imagine the demand for these plays. So everything went in. It's very difficult in this genre of comedia, for example, to distinguish between what is comedy and what is, which, what is tragedy, because everything was sort of mixed in. So um, that's sort of the tradition that we're working with here. That's sort of where, where he's coming from. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to the, the, the plot and the names, how much of this is just sort of picking names out of antiquity to get the audience in the gates um, rather than sort of like a, a real desire to retell these narratives. It's, um, it's always, I think, you know, in many ways it's uh, told in relation to the audience in many ways. Um, I mean, just the beginning of the play, you already heard that, that Thetis um, destroyed Peleus mm -hmm. and this island that in which we find ourselves at the beginning is actually this deserted island uh, created by the goddess of her wrath for being raped by these by Peleus in a sense. So the elements are there for somebody who might know the story, but they're also sort of completely being recasted anew for anybody who doesn't know them. So right, because I mean just the motif of like, you know, if we go back to the bion, right? The the marriage, uh, the marriage of Daedemia and um, Achilles, right? You get these sweet passages, well, maybe not so sweet, where Achilles is saying, oh, I'm just like one of your sisters, let me sleep in bed with you. Um, and, you know, weird sort of uh, romantic thing. Where mm -hmm. here, um, Achilles is menacing in a way. Um, that's surprising if you're coming at it from the tradition. So as a homerist, the title mm -hmm. of the play jumps out at me. Yes. Right. Um, so you, you, the, you know, the monster in the garden, right? And you just described this as sort of riffing on um, Statius. Um, 
is there a complex view of, of heroes and, and demigods? Are we seeing the monstrous in a different way as well? Or am I reading too much into it? No, you're not reading. Uh, you're actually like on the right path here because I think monster is the key word here. Monster in what respect? And uh, this first act that we just saw, or a, a episode of the first act, that will give you one definition. But uh, the thing about Calderonian plays is that you will find them, again, at the beginning when I was talking with Lana, I was explaining to her why it's not a good idea to approach it as, you know, the Spanish Shakespeare. I think it's a, actually a very bad path to go on because you will not understand the drama entirely. This is a play that uh, takes all the elements of the Comedia, the ones I just talked about, also music, poetry, uh, stage action, anything you can think of. But Calderon takes those elements, you can find another place of the time, and he makes something kind of unique out of it. He adds this sort of intellectual cohesion, and uh, he creates a sort of edifice, thematic, um, plot-wise, I mean, more like thematic, it's more like a theater of ideas in a sense. Mm. That well, that's why I was going to ask, I, you know, I don't know a lot about sort of Spanish semantics in the time period, um, but, you know, the Latin monstrum, right, can be monster, but also omen, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, and does Monstro have that um, valence as well? In a way, in, in a way it does. Also the idea of a prodigy, something amazing. So in a way that already connects with the reason why this will be attractive for a theater goer in a sense. But I mean, but the point I was trying to make with, the, with that sort of sense of monster is that in the theater of Calderon, these things are never isolated. You can see them being reflected and explored at so many different levels. Now we see the sort of wild creature that comes out. Later, you're gonna see the monster in the garden, which is gonna be a very different monster, a woman monster in a civilized place. So you'll see it sort of uh, be much, you'll see how it varies, how, how Candelon varies it as he goes to his play. So it's, a play, it's, it's, so it's worthwhile to basically pay attention to the larger level of this thing. Uh, sometimes I get the impression that we're working with allegories in a sense, like these very elaborate allegories, very Baroque allegories. But one thing that we can never forget with him is that Calderon always inserts an element of uh, emotion and, uh, and sensuousness to the whole story that sort of makes that allegory sort of breathe and live in a sense, like Pygmalion statue in a sense. So, I mean, that's something to also take into account as we continue looking at the play. So you've already anticipated a few things that people mm -hmm. should look for. Um, as we're moving into the, the, the next third of the play, um, what are some themes or sort of key words that you would tell people to keep an eye out for? Again, to look beyond the individual characters, to look beyond the plot, to look at all these sort of higher levels, because in a way that's what Calderon's purpose is. And there's, that's the reason why he's considered a great playwright, the way he sort of, um, sort of looks at these things, especially from the perspective of the inner human being. You, see, you saw it already very well expressed in that scene with Achilles coming out of the cave and discovering nature, discovering sort of falling in love with this woman and trying to dis describe himself what love is and the way it, it's affecting him. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that's very important for this drama. And the reason why it's so emotional and so human in a sense, you know, it always sort of projected from the inside. I mean, sort of exploring the cosmos of within a person's head, individual experience in a sense. That's one important theme there. The other one that's very important is the fights and the tension between, for example, free will, human will and constraints, social desire, and uh, also divine oracles, etc. You hear, you see it very clearly here. We already saw it in the, in the scene that just passed by. Deidamia also, I mean, Achilles will struggle with his destiny here because he's gonna fall in love. He's gonna wanna stay in the island with Deidamia, but he also is called back often to his nature, whatever the nature is. And that's something that Caderon explores. But Deidamia is also another character that sort of um, has her own duties. And at the same time, is forced to come to terms with them in a sense. And uh, also struggles with the duty to her father and her own dislike of marrying somebody she doesn't know. So we also see that conflict there. And finally, one more thing that's really interesting in this play, and I think that was talking to the cast before the, the, before the play began, is the fact that um, the, the cross-dressing element is really interesting as well. So, I mean, that's something that we can discuss, discuss perhaps at the end, but I did, I did want to point out one aspect here that's very interesting. In Spanish theater, women acted. That's one thing that was true about um, of that of that theatrical tradition. Um, but in this play, scholars tend to agree that Achilles was actually played by a man. But let us not forget the fact that before Calderon, another very important Spanish playwright, Tirso de Molina, wrote his own Achilles. Achilles, there he had a woman play Achilles. 
So what we're seeing in uh, in today's in today in Carlos's production today is actually, but something somebody in the in the 17th century Spanish theater would not be amazed to see a woman playing the character of the male hero. So I mean, we can talk about that later on. I mean, what will be the? I mean, I have no answers to this, but I find it really striking. But we can explore the the tensions that arise from this sort of uh, sexual, you know the cross-dressing game that we have there. And it's Gender. useful It's useful to bring it up because audiences of this play would have other Achilles, right, in their minds, right, yeah. different actors. And it would have been a woman's, it would have been a woman Achilles. Right, right. And uh, uh, Very different from the Globe Theater. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so thank you. So we'll turn now to the, the next scene where we're going to see Achilles again um, and look for many of the things Francisco just mentioned to us. Thank you. Oh, am I not one of you? Why am I being chased? Am I being punished for stepping out into the light of day to seek out a voice that stole my dreams? Moreover, oh heavens, in the midst of all this confusion, I have lost my way back to the grotto. Where will I go find it? Stop, you human beast! Mio será el placer de traerte a los pies de Deida Mia. You aren't lucky enough to please her. Stop now, reasonable human monster, for my hope is the heavens grant me the fortune to bring me to bring you to Mars altar. Espera, no te muevas. Where can I go surrounded as I am like this? Surrender now. Don't go. No, you did not offend me. It is no shame to be sought by those who would honor you. I don't know anything about that. All I know is the deity who keeps me will be angry if she doesn't find me where she left me. How are you going to escape us all? Divine deity! How is it I am out of your love because of such a small infraction? The center of the earth tears open her hard breast in order to hide him. Who can doubt that a powerful deity watches over him? Against such a powerful deity, human power is not enough. Although they all flee, I will remain on the opposite path. I will find him, powerful baby, where you may keep him. Is this mercy? Yes. You don't want it. What are you thinking of doing? Throw yourself off the highest cliff straight into the sea? Where your life will end and your anxieties will finally be over. Think now, it is in vain. Consider, it is not possible. It is not late to be obedient. Before you saw the harmony of the skies, the pride of the mountains, the splendor of the flowers, the beauty of the birds, and the restless, majestic sea. You tolerated your destiny with blind, faithful ignorance and eternal patience. But after you saw them, after you saw that Deida Mia, how can I expect you to live your life without her and without the beauty of the world? Cruel, merciful one? I raised you, I guarded you, 
I praised you, I tormented you, and you wish not to obey me. Such beauty drags you? You have no choice but to follow it. Well, since your passion has reached such an extreme, let mine reach one as well. And may one shock be small repair for such unhappiness. What do I intend? That you know the danger you are in. And for me to serve as liaison. So that you may be near, update Amir. And yet, remain safe near me. Yo soy prodigioso Aquiles, ya que declararme es fuerza. Tetis, hija de Neptuno. I am Tetis, daughter of Neptune. Peleo, príncipe altivo de la isla, tras las fieras la campaña discurría, cuando viendo mi belleza, para desdichas no es vanidad que la encarezca. Solicitó mis favores. Peleus, proud prince, solicited my affection. Y advirtiendo cuánto era imposible a su deseo, ingrata mi resistencia dispuso. Basta pues, ay infelice, que embrión de una violencia fuiste, porque no te quejes de mí, sino de tu estrella, pues eres tan desdichado que cuando todos se precian que nacieron de un amor, Naciste tú de una fuerza. You are a product of a violent encounter. Yo ofendida, yo quejosa, porque nunca se supiera que tuvo logro su injuria, ni que dio fruto mi afrenta. A él le di muerte. I gave Peleus his death and set fire to this island. Y la isla quemé, no dejando en ella testigo. Do not blame me for your fate. Something struggled within my breast upon seeing you. A rancor mixed with tenderness. What innocence from such malice. I raised you in secret, seeing your prodigious birth. I wished throughout your life to read your destiny in the golden letters of that book, which is the sky. And I managed to find out that a fiery battle would threaten you in the future, a battle most bloody. Mars in his oracle orders that in the center of those ruins you will be found because you alone are needed for this war. How Achilles can you conquer love, the oracle and the gods? Medemia's cousin was called Astrea. Her ship was lost at sea. No one in this island knows her. If you wear her dress and her name, you will be safe from harm. Disguised, let us see what power the heavens have over your destiny. From horror, he goes to beauty. So disguise his shape, that who once was a monster of this wilderness become a monster in a garden. If I am to live with Edamia, if I am to adore her beauty, it matters if I lose my name, myself, my honor, and my fame. Do not delay this happiness that you offer me. Give me ingenuity to disguise my ignorance. So let the monster of the wilderness become the monster of the garden. What new oracle is this that rings in the air? Without Achilles, this war will never resolve itself in our favor. This is what Mars Oracle has decreed. How can the gods give us this news, but not reveal where he is? An enemy power is allowing Achilles to escape us, 
but I will not surrender to these obstacles. If there is a God who keeps him, there are others who can seek him out. These days and nights, my cunning has come up with two instruments, one of cured rough skins and the other of smooth twisted metals. Both resound with the kind of luck that harmoniously enjoins the sounds of war and calls up the voice of Mars and the language of the winds and stirs up the soul of the soldier. I will find Achilles yet. Mira, ahí está. Se está acercando. So it is wise that you play my servant now. What's new, Ambassador? Much to fear, Madam. Una carta del rey de Epirus llegó. Lidoro, obedient of his free will, has shipped out because he wished that no one else but him came for you. ¿Está contenta de escuchar eso? No. And since the letter has arrived without him, I am saddened. Moreover, because a ship was found break ashore. ¿Y ahora? ¿Está contenta? Sí. Mientes, tendría que estar triste. No sé mucho de sentimientos, señor. I am sad to hear, sir, that what you say may be true. ¿Ves? Si le importo. Esto. Tell the trouble of there to speak to me, because I would like to know what happened. I was. Indeed, mi señora, who presumed nothing would make me happier than to sacrifice my life to yours. And now you find me humbly at your feet. I must confess I remain grateful to you. From this moment on, I offer to make possible whatever you desire. Beso el peso if such earth as think I am worthy enough to kiss, I will tell you my desire. Tell me. Not now. Why not? No me atrevo. What? Oh, I should think before I say anything. Bueno, cuando lo hayas pensado bien, me lo dirás. The ship was from... Epirus and Lidora was on it. Since it wasn't a strass ship, that means she was not in harm's way. Give me your report later then. No parece importarle mucho nuestro matrimonio. ¿Y qué vas a hacer? To write, my dear Dante. Tell me what you want me to tell the prince of Greece, sir. My friendship appreciates entering into this heroic alliance, but until I see Achilles sell off to Troy, and we all saw him, even though we don't know the God who hides him from us, I will not dare go to battle because it will be a losing one. Mars makes it difficult for us. I will tell them this on both our behalfs, and I swear from this day on that I will bring Achilles to you. No sooner did I see this palace that all my senses were disturbed. Oh, I'll try to mask your fear and recover quickly. Your Majesty, sir. I, yo soy Astrea y quisiera hablar con usted. Beautiful Astrea, your confusion excuses you from your fluid rhetoric. You must kiss Vidamia's hand. Hermosa Vidamia, please let me kiss your hand. And forgive me for not coming here sooner. Tenemos tanto que contarnos, and yet I cannot remember anything since I last saw you. Tocar tu mano es algo que no puedo olvidar. Never in my life have I seen such beauty. 
rice, sweet cousin. And believe me when I say that I wish for you not to be my servant, but my friend. <laughs> what good fortune is this when much is ventured and so much is gained? Now, Ulysses, since this conversation and its obligations interrupt our conversation, let us return to matters at hand. Not once, but a thousand times. Do I give my word to the highest powers that on the day Achilles is found again, I will give all my support to help Greece so that she may defeat Troy. Dear heavens, is it so important that I obey the will of the gods? And I say again that I give my word once and a thousand times over to not rest until I find Achilles. Uh, Miros, sir, is a ship that dipped rapidly through the waves and found its nest in our port. Without a doubt, Lidoro. If it's Lidoro who has reached our shores, there will be quite a recompense for you. Let's go to the dock so that I may see that snowy swan swim on the sea foam. Goodbye, Deida Mia. May the heavens watch over you. Come on, Astrea. you leave, listen to me. You have heard how sought after you are. I don't have to tell you that in keeping your identity hidden lies your safety. Be silent and restrained because you have little time before your time is up. That is something you should tell my love. It's not possible for fire to suffer silently without some smoke, not sparks. Proud sheep who comes through the crystal waves. If you are the owner of my cruel shame, do not reach the shore. Why, sailor, don't you go another port? You are here, Astrea. Disculpa, no quería escuchar. Little do I care that you did, Astrea. It was you who hurt me. I confide in you. I trust you. <sighs> Against my will, my father, the king, arranged my marriage to Lidoro, prince of Epirus. Estás casada? Married? No. Entonces aún hay esperanzas. But we've made arrangements. Bueno, si no estás casada, ¿por qué esa tristeza? So much was I again surrendering my liberty to one I did not know. That what was once merely unavoidable has now become hateful. To ask me to love someone whom I don't even know is Fierce slavery. Que los cielos te den fuerza. What do you care about all this, Estrella? Speak. No sé si deba. Well, I want to know. Quiero decirlo. Say it then. Qué hermosa vida mía. Tu perfección. Le da a mayo su orden y abril sus leyes. En el templo de Marte, un joven te vio, pero no pudo, de pudo declararte su amor porque solo sabía sentir tu ausencia y sus sentimientos lo obligaron a venir a tu corte. Disfrazado. Su sangre es noble. El hombre enmascarado se le conoce como 
No puedo decirlo. This is the one secret I must keep from you. I appreciate your warning. Astrea, te ordeno que me digas quién es este hombre en cuanto lo veas. If you do not, I will complain about you. Oh, love you here much. Why did you stop? Tell me. Puedes verlo desde aquí. I see no one. Observa bien. Lo verás. In the whole garden, there is no one but us two girls. Solo nosotras? Yes. Bueno, si dices que estamos solas y yo estoy aquí, no es difícil resolver el misterio. What? Your lover is here! What do I see? Always me. Esta carta, madame, le hará saber quién soy. This is how I treat letters given to me by someone who dares enter my garden and shows up in disguise. He thinks I meant him. No need of that here. I know who you are. Bueno, si ya lo sabes, debes escucharme. Defeated by the sea, I landed on this Isle of Mars, where I saw your beauty. That's what you say. I have come to be the third wheel against myself, for I declared myself on behalf of another. Escondí mi nombre y mi identidad. To come to you as I am. Decir mi nombre no debería ofenderla. What do you mean, to come as you are? Sabes quién soy, no? Well, now I don't want to know. Tell my father, um... Yo. No more. Pudiera. Enough. Decir. Not a word from your lips. I will go to give you time. Astrea, do not follow me. La he ofendido? Yes. Decir quién era? No. Entonces, ¿por qué? In not telling me to speak to me that there is a love or disguise for me and find out it was Lidoro? Oh, no sé. You lied to me again. Do not insult me. What? No me refería a él. Then whom? You see and do not see. You speak to him and do not speak. You hear and do not hear because it is the delirium of the gods of love's frenzy. A prodigious monster is hidden in your garden. No en vano. Las luces, bellas, que el sol en sus nombres dora, osan con tan bella aurora competir con las estrellas. My siren. Such sweet music. Tell me, has Astrea come by? Está llegando. Dear Estrella, where have you been? I have missed you. Why are you so sad? Cousin? Venía caminando hacia acá y escuché que un mensaje le fue enviado. 
A message from whom? Libano. Upon knowing a merchant from a nearby island had arrived, Lidoro lo envió para que eligiera las joyas que más le gusten. Such generosity augurs either malice or ignorance. Bueno, si tienes tantas dudas, lo dejaré entrar. Ah, ah, me duele la espalda de cargar todo esto. El gran príncipe Lidoro le manda este tesoro, algo que seguro le gustará. Let's see what jewels you bring. I'll take notice of everything. Mira, estas telas y estas joyas. Ah, a ver, a ver, ¿qué, ¿qué color le gusta? ¿O qué le gusta más? Eh, I don't know. ¿Qué, qué opina de este diamante? ¿eh? Uh, bueno, yo no he visto diamante más bonito. Hmm. Well, then... ¡Astrea! ¡It is yours! No me gusta. Why not? Diré que no a todo. You'll upset me if you don't choose something. Bueno. Tomaré... Este escudo, esta lanza, esas plumas y esta espada. That's what you have chosen. Sí. Extraña elección. Where there are jewels, you take weapons. Mm, I am grateful for his attentions and his generosity. Le diré todo lo que usted desee. ¿Mm? Ah, ah, sí, y si no le molesta, eh, puedo, puedo volver otro día. Tal vez vea algo que le guste más. Come back whenever you wish. Mm Pálido ceño de la noche fría, que limitaba sombra, desvanece y asombra la luz del sol, el rocicler del día. Siendo un abismo tanto, todo horror, todo miedo, todo espanto. Todo horror, todo miedo, todo espanto. Y es cuando toco y piso, pues apenas diviso, en las arrugas del nocturno manto, atenta a mi querella. Ni una luz, ni un reflejo, ni una estrella. Ni una luz, ni un reflejo, ni una estrella. En el cielo aparece. Ay, cuánto favorece mi pretensión. Y de la mía bella, pues cuando en este traje vengo a hablarle, falta el sol, la luna huye, el viento calla. Falta el sol, la luna huye y el viento calla. Cuando firme y constante vengo a ver un amante, tan enigma de amor que a descifrarla no hay valor que se atreva. Tal mueve, tal admira, tal eleva. Tal mueve, tal admira, tal eleva de mi vida el suceso. ¿Qué más diga mí es esta y aún por eso su nueva psiquis con fragancia nueva? Saludo los verdores de las hojas, las ramas y las flores. De las hojas, de las ramas y las flores. El vulgo ha respirado, sin duda que ha llegado el cuidado que es el Dios de los amores. Mi dueño. Gloria mía. Salió el sol. Vino el alba. Llegó el día. Do you like that I have come here to the garden at night dressed in this costume? Yes, because in women's clothes, it seems to me your affection would be much more violent. Then I am twice the monster. You're a woman by day, you're a man by night. 
you do not deserve either my love as a woman or a man because you do not appeal to me as either a woman or a man. Please, do not say such things. What more do you want from me? That knowing who you are, I continue to hide you. I have pained illness to delay my marriage. Do not be angry, even though you have reason to be. Do you cry? No. I only wish to cry with tears. Someone's here. Parecen humanas, señor. Veamos quiénes son. No, 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 espere, espere. Regresemos. Idiota, ¿qué clase de consejo es ese? ¿Cómo no voy a saber quién deambula en este jardín a esta hora? Ah, ah, pues con no querer es suficiente. They are looking for us. Hi. I will stay here to stop them from going further. I live my life in your hands. Uno de ellos se va. Eso parece. Y el otro no se mueve. Eso parece. ¿Quién está ahí? Who asked me? A man who wants to know how you enter this garden. Deberías hacerte la misma pregunta. Yo tengo mis razones. As do I. Debo saber quién eres. And I insist in not telling you. ¿Qué están haciendo? What is this I hear? Is it you who has left me sleepless night after night? I must know you. Well, this one comes mistaken. Thank God. He's in my faith. Gentlemen, if you have come seeking, as you have said, the monster of this garden, I will have you know. Acabas de dejarlo escapar e intentas capturar el hombre equivocado. Do not defend yourself. I do not fully seek your death, but rather to make you choice conqueror. I am Ulysses. Ulysses? Bueno, pues yo soy Lidoro. Vi dos figuras y me escondí en los arbustos para observarlos. Lo escuché llamarse a sí mismo the monster of these gardens. ¿Qué debía hacer? ¿Qué debía hacer sabiendo que otro hombre estaba en este jardín? To know who this man is, who makes us both restless, is to know the distance between Venus and Mars. ¿Qué hombre se escondería durante el día y la noche? I have reasons to believe. Un miedo se podrá de mí. And not without a cause. No es en vano. With so many signs, I do believe that if I got her, her disdain, that the heavens have sent me. Jealousy will claim me. Daughter, I come with two pieces of news. I have, on behalf of Akaya, Astrea's country. Where is she? Estoy, señor. It gives me great anxiety to tell you that Astrea's boat was wrecked at sea. And it, and it makes sense to wonder how can it be that one Astrea has perished and another Astrea is here with you? Pero, señor, yo... Cuando llegué... Vean su confusión. So much confusion causes deep doubt. It is foolish to give it credit to that rumor. It very well could be hearsay. Meanwhile, let, let us leave this topic and let us talk of something more important. Lidoro. Your father writes to me on how much he misses you. And although Deidamia's health is not to be predicted from one day to the next, it is not possible to delay the wedding any longer. And thus, I wish that the wedding ceremony be held today. Agree to this. You know, I can only obey. 
I cannot choose my fate. With a torch they bring for you and Lidoro, in demonstration of the love that burns between you, both of you shall be united. Leave me on. I must prepare myself for the ceremony. Claro, discúlpanos. You leave me too, Astra? Yes, ingrate. Because your cruelty kills me with such severity that you've become a tyrant to my eyes. I go without sleep, my love. I... Don't go on, don't go on, don't say a word. My life, my dear, listen, you are my sovereign. You're not getting married? Yes. But you love me. Obligation comes before passion. It's a good excuse for a virtue born of blame. Do me a good turn. What is that? Don't surrender to your sadness. What new beast is this? This is the language of war. Oh, who can listen to such a noise and not fight? May the Greek Empire live! And may Troy be destroyed in blood and fire! Achilles! Your death is near. Perdón? No entendía. ¿Quién le habla? Excuse me, beautiful Astrea. I am to speak to you on a worse blind. I thought, Rob Miriam, that I spoke with Achilles. Forgive me, because now I see, woman, that you are not Achilles. Nor could you ever be. Because the young man who Mars, destiny is for glory would never be caught wearing such clothes as yours, would never take the time to shave and use perfume, because such coolness stains the soul. Espera! <clears throat> no puedes irte. What do you want? Necesito tiempo para responder. Is it so urgent? Sí. What is it? I have resolved. Go on. Prepare a horse for me and sound your instruments, Ulysses. When they are ready, I need to leave this palace. Whatever you wish, Astrea. It is done. Fortune, you lost the day you lost Deidamia. I will give love to love's temple. Goodbye, flowers. Goodbye, fountains. Goodbye, Deidamia. Where are you going with sword in hand? I cannot Pink. stay. I cannot stay. It is not possible to go on with our lie. What? What are you saying? What is true? Ulysses called my name. You deny it. I couldn't. Your pride has caused this. Your betrayal has caused this. What? Goodbye, Deidamia. I don't want to see you in someone else's arms. You hear me first. Hi, Achilles. Lose my life if I lose you. Don't leave me. Don't leave me to myself. Even if fame, honor, and kingdom are at stake, I am yours. Don't go. How can I? 
can I leave you more? Just life and honor, fame and glory. Mars' voice calls to me. Yet, I choose not to respond to its spell. My love, sovereign. It is not a time of war, but of love. ¿Quién está en tus brazos, Deida mía? You know, the monster in the garden. What's this? Astrea, you fight with Lidoro? That lie is over. I am ashamed to hear such a name. I am Achilles. I have been a traitor to your house because I was in love with Edamia. Now she is my wife. So, do what you will. Kill him! Oh, it's me. No! I am taking him with me. Listen, all of you, to Tetis. Today is the fatal day that threatened Achilles with auguries. The trance in which he finds himself is clear sign of this. It is from this that I wish to free him, thinking I could spare him from the call of war. But instead, it has been peace that has brought him and us to this very juncture. Don't take away, the alien Greeks, your happiness by killing that for which you live and wait for. It is not a time of war, but of love. I will forget my words. Yo dejaré ir mis celos. Entonces, larga vida, Aquiles. Give Deida Mia your hand. I am happy. <laughs> Great fortune is mine. Y como un prodigioso testigo de todo esto, I say, thus ends the monster in the garden. So <laughs> we're left with the ending of that play with, in sort of a, let's say, counterfactual narrative from the point of view of myth. Um, so Francisco, um, you know, let, let's start with the most complicated thing that you mentioned before, which is allegory. Um, sort of, can you help to sort of walk us through some of the allegories you see in this play um, and where, where that ending sort of leaves us? Allegory, I think, in the sense of it's almost like an allegorical narrative and uh, it's faithful to, to the themes, the one I just told you about, which is the most obvious one, of course, the oracle that Achilles will help the Greeks defeat the Trojans. Um, you see that sort of trace towards the play and the way that sort of um, Achilles sort of fights against it. So that would be one of the allegorical elements. The other thing, for example, you can see allegory. I mean, you can see that sort of allegorical theme played out by the fact that often, you know, characters come in and say things that are unexpected. So you get the sense of destiny working, not against the characters, but with the characters themselves, sort of presenting itself. Sometimes, you know, characters hear a word and they think it's an omen in this play. Um, so that sort of will be the, one of the allegorical elements there. Monster as well. I mean, the whole way the monster gets explored in so many different angles as, you know, monster in the wilderness, the monster in the garden, a man dressed like a woman, a woman dressed like a woman, a woman dressed like a man dressed like a woman. <laughs> those, all those elements are basically coming in. Uh, for you to unpack, basically. So, um, when, you know, the play ends with it's sort of a, a classic motif in Greek tragedy, which is the Dea Ex Machina, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. But from, from and this is my first viewing of this play, um, Thetis seems to come down and, and then just com completely undo what's going to happen with this prophecy. Like, how, how does this sort of prodigy, this omen at the end, engage with the monster allegories you were mentioning? It's uh, it's complex in a sense. I mean, that's the reason why I'm telling you that it's actually um, Calderon actually is, is kind of sophisticated and it's, and it's a drama that you need to sort of think through 
Because like Tita says, this is something that happens in a time of love, not a time of war. And you got, again, the allegory, the temple of uh, Mars in the background. Mm -hmm. And the earthquake that you see at the beginning where you, know, you see the movement of the earth, that's actually caused by Venus in the play. So mm -hmm. because she sort of moves so that, so that they do not know who Achilles, where Achilles is actually, that's where you get the plot from. So already there, for example, you got this sort of movement towards a redefinition of the whole episode as you know, uh, sort of focused on love, but also at the same time focused on the fact that Achilles, the, the tension between Achilles' duty and passion in a sense. Mm -hmm. So in a way, this is, a, this is a nice play in the sense that he has the two things at the very end. And he has them within the time of peace and love in a sense. But he sort of creates his path towards his own role as hero, but at the same time sort of uh, renouncing um, love, so sort of kind of living up for his duty, but that's kind of in a way rewarded in itself by his own progress, by his own creation of his own destiny to speak it the way of his own sort of working with destiny in order to come to the position of being the husband of uh, Deidamia and uh, at the same time the Trojan warrior. So again, um, so I, you're gonna, you were gonna say something. Well, I, I, was, I wanted you to expand a bit on that theme of, you know, you mentioned before, free will, um, yeah. determinism, um, but also in the sort of the contrast between sort of desire and duty, right? Um, yeah. Because a theme that's part of this that, you know, is very much 16th century or 17th century and not ancient Greece is this betrothal of Deidamia to someone else. Right. Um, so, so how does it, it sort of like entwined um, plots respond to to the culture of the time? Right. The betrothal, the love, the passion for war. Um, how is this playing on audience expectations? Um, I think, you know, um, I could just give you a general um, answer to that, because I'm not very uh, not very knowledgeable to be able to explore all the cultural elements there. Mm -hmm. um, just like you, I'm sort of an expert in Greek tragedy. So therefore, this is completely new when I teach this even. And every time I see this, I rediscover new elements. But definitely one thing that I now that I'm reading a lot of the 18th century um, theorists of Spain, especially when it comes to tragedy and drama and drama, one thing they do put their finger on is the fact that, you know, this is a theater that's focused a lot on, on erotic passion in a sense. Mm -hmm. it's a I mean, it's, these issues are explored through basically erotic, erotic attraction. It becomes a very important element to be able to explore reason and emotion, for example. And uh, that's one. Uh, that's a major sort of a motor in this play as well, as you can see. As you know, but that's also a motor not only for Achilles to fulfill his destiny, but also and a way to also sort of establish his own domination of his own self, which is another very important theme of Calderon. But it also becomes a way to sort of uh, see how human beings enter the world, just like Achilles did from his cave, and sort of deal with the tensions and the voices and the music and the opposite feelings that they get when they actually get to encounter reality in a sense. So in this case, this is a very artificial reality, but it's a reality that sometimes is a little bit even more real than the real world around us because the fact that it's so concentrated in its dramatic effect. I mean, that's again, the art of Calderon there. And, you know, the, the allegorizing uh, of the Trojan War myth is something, I mean, it goes pretty that ancient, right? So the judgment of Paris by many philosophers was seen as an allegory between different types of desires. Um, and so the, what you just mentioned, sort of using this story as a vehicle for exploring reason um, and passion, um, it's not a new thing, but it's really interesting in this context. And one of the cultural elements that I found fascinating in the way it's paired in this play is that bit um, where Achilles here, you know, a woman as an actor is dressed up as a man who's been dressed up as a woman before, um, and they meet at the garden at night. Um, and there's that fascinating exchange between Dedemia and Achilles about like, who's the monster to be afraid of at night, right? And what it means to play these different gendered roles sexually. Um, what are we sort of missing in the context, in the performance context of these plays um, uh, about this? Because this is a hard scene for me to imagine in Shakespeare, uh, but it seems that it works in this play. Um, I really don't, um, uh, what is the this aspect that you find there? I mean, it's kind of, you know, it sounds like, I mean, I don't know if you can explain more because I think you're sort of, it would be good for you to sort of expand on that because I think you're you're hitting on important things. Well, I mean, there's cross-dressing and there's actors who are already cross-dressing. And then there is ex exploration of different assumptions of what gendered roles should be like in a romantic relationship, mm -hmm. right? And so I find that exchange to be pretty sophisticated and interesting and something that, you know, it seems really modern and, and urgent now. Yes. Um, have you seen other play, other pl uh, similar plays like this in, in this period? 
In Calderon, especially, you do see this conflict a lot. And uh, but again, every time it, it the thing about the theater is that it often seems to be repeating itself. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a little bit like new comedy. I mean, people yeah. in the audience might be more familiar with that. You have to pay attention to their variations, and uh, they can be very significant. So in this case, you got the sort of variation of the warrior versus the lover. That's one of the things that we have here, especially with the character of Achilles. Um, and um, other things that I can think of when it comes to this, I was thinking about them and. Um, I forgot now. <laughs> so, so, no, like, I mean, there's so much that's rich here. I'm glad you brought up new comedy um, uh -huh. because they, we make a big mistake, I think, in jumping from ancient Greek tragedy, you know, uh, 2000 years later, because there's so much that's happened um, in the Iberian Peninsula and in culture in between, right? There's so many different genres in here and definitely with the themes of disguise and mistaken identity and betrothals. There's some, you know, Menander, Plautus type stuff there that, that's familiar. Um, and, I, you know, one final question before we sort of bring the audience members in. Um, we, when we've talked before about Greek tragedy, we talk about all the performance aspects that we're missing, the mm -hmm. chorus, the dance, the costumes. What are we missing when we're just reading these plays? You miss the spectacle. And uh, this is another way in which these comedia writers are completely anti-Aristotelian. For them, theater is central. Stage action is central. Music is central. Sta scenery is central. They do, do uh, they do a lot with it. Um, a lot of people say that this play, for example, was actually, um, Calderon wrote for the popular theater, but he also wrote for the court. And uh, the Spanish court of Philip IV had a very sophisticated theater um, built that actually had very sophisticated Italian machinery to make these sort of um, great sets, moving sets, sort of changing sets. So Calderon wrote for that. And there's a very funny exchange between him and one of the first Italian set designers in which, you know, he's basically criticizing him for, okay, here you just like, you know, changing scenery just to entertain the audience, but that's not good because it doesn't help my drama. But afterwards, he recommends to this, the, to this guy, you know, to the set designer, you know, why don't you do this and this and that? This, introduce these spectacles because these these will work with my theater so that's something that's basic for their theater in a sense and so now i guess to maybe we'll bring in carlos first i'll start with you francisco how how, how is seeing it um performed in this context sort of made you think of this play in particular differently um i think you know this will be a format that actually i think calderon himself will actually be very happy to have um handle because it really does offer him other ways of exploring this dramatically. I think the Zoom format gives you different options to explore this, you know, the windows that open and close, the, the sudden appearance of characters, the different going from a video to going to the, the performances in the, you know, little Zoom windows. He would have had a field day in this when it comes to, um, I personally, I'm just like, you know, for me, I, like I told you already, I mean, some of the problems that I have with my responses to your questions, Joel, is the fact that I'm very puzzled by this play. Often it's, you know, <laughs> I do not know what to do about it. And I think that's one of the things you frequently find with Calderon. You are, you're, you're sort of dropped in this morass of images, ideas, music, action, and you're sort of left to sort of struggle just like Achilles does when he comes out of the cave. I mean, what is this that I have before me? I can see that this is this, but maybe it's a, this other thing. That's sort of, you know, the only way to sort of summarily describe it as this sort of Baroque sensibility that's coming at you straight from the this production, I think is something that I also found in this um, Zoom production as well. And, and it definitely, I mean, it's a kind of mixture where you feel like maybe if you had a couple drinks, it might make more sense. I'm not quite oh. sure. <laughs> Carlos, uh, it's great to see you again. It's been a bit. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, you, you've given me so much to think about, um, especially I love, uh, I mean, I, there are so many questions I want to ask. I love the bilingual nature of the play. I don't know much Spanish, um, but really like moving back and forth, uh, it was fascinating and really powerful. Um, but can you talk to me a little bit about your process in, in trying to make sense of this play and, and put it on Zoom in a coherent fashion? Well, it was kind of complicated because you have uh, the or original verse in Spanish from Calderón de la Barca that it is so different from our language in Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, Francisco won't let me lie. And then we have the English tr translation. And then I ask if I could make a translation of the translation. And that's <laughs> well, why this happened, because we have some of the original verse in Spanish, and then we have the American version, and then we have a more colloquial Spanish version all mixed together in one. 
So I, I really try to find a way to have all the mythical creatures and characters like the king, Achilles, and Ulysses talking, talking in English. Well, as, as you heard before, and all the other characters like uh, Lidoro and Livio and Astrea, in a way of saying, in Spanish, because they are from another country. So that's why it made sense, well, to me, <laughs> to have them talk in Spanish and then in English and kind of having a common tongue so they can understand each other perfectly. Like if you say something in English, I will understand. And if I say something in Spanish, well, I get it. Uh, language, it is not an issue. And also gender it isn't an issue here. So I really wanted to play with that. And it came off re really well. Had you, have you worked much with the, with the plays of Calderon before? Well, uh, with Calderon, not really uh, acting, but as, an, as uh, analyzing it in my school. We try, we, well, we have verse in scenic combat in my university. So mm -hmm. we study Calderón de la Barca and also Lope de Vega. So I kind of know the, the structure of the, of the verse, that it, it is so much different. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, pointing to the difference can be a little dangerous because we do miss like some of the conventions that are the same, but the, the mixture of, you know, the language, the characters um, really brought out, um, you know, the movement from, as Francisco says, from one allegorical monster to another, but also keeping us in the action. And I think part of what, um, what you really did well was bring in actors um, who really almost made it seem seamless. seamless. I'd like to talk to some of them um, now. Maybe I'll start with Achilles. So Elizabeth, um, you, you were a fascinating Achilles, right? Um, what, <laughs> right? Uh, so how do you go playing this role? Like, well, what did you know about Achilles beforehand? And, and what, what did you, you know, discover about the character in this role? Okay, well, first of all, hi. <laughs> hi, nice um, to meet you. Thank you, nice to meet you too. Thank you for the question. Well. Achilles is a very weird character because um, I read about his character in Greek mythology, right? He's the greatest warrior of all time. He's very like, I don't, I don't like to say like masculine, but masculine. Mm -hmm. And so at first I was very confused about why in the play they say that Achilles has to be played by a woman. So it was very interesting to try to explore how I, Lisbeth, can portray Achilles and it was also very weird I was talking to Emma about this the other day like the Greek myth is so different from what this play is like Achilles at the end he goes to war he falls with the I'm sorry my, my brain blanked out <laughs> for a second <laughs> he goes to war and he dies and in this play he says no I get to choose my own destiny I get to choose what happens to me I don't go to war so it was very fun to just keep on exploring like why is he doing everything that he does yeah. it was confusing but I decided to go with that confusion no yeah, so and, and I, I think that brought uh, oh, Francisco were you gonna jump in there I think that's a good way to sort of begin to explore Calderon in a way, just letting you going on with the confusions until you begin to sort of unravel them. Right. Yes. And em embracing the madness. And, you know, part of, I think, what, what made your character's sort of development really work is the interaction um, with Arancha's um, De Demia. So, Arancha, do you, do you want to come in? You want to join us? Hi. Yeah, thank you. Hey, hey. Um, so tell me a little bit. Uh, so De Demia uh, is a very different character from Achilles, um, but she also goes through, you know, developments in the play, right? There's some tension there. Um, so what did you see in the character? Yeah, well, uh, first she's, well, in this role that she's the princess and she has to obey her fate, but she already knows that she doesn't want it. So I think she sees an Achilles like an escape from that reality. Uh. And that's really interesting. I mean, um, it's not like uh, many comedies uh, in, in that were re written like Lopa de Vega style or so that I don't have the, how to translate the Comedia de Enredos. Um, 
but it's it's fun because uh, you you get this uh, idea that that she likes him as a girl or uh, she likes him as as a, as a man what, what is this play saying what what is is uh, is is the princess uh, desire and that is really uh, a good play for me like a um, play in in the in the sense of playing yeah <laughs> so I, i really like that right and, and that's sort of i think that's part of the key of the play right we find both characters in these transitional moments where they don't really know what they want who they want to be with who they want to be Um, and the end of the play, like that's why I mentioned sort of the friend fantasy thing uh, before, right? Where they they make a different choice, one that's surprising, right? Um, maybe not totally satisfying. Francisco, what, what do you think of that? I, I would say that they actually do know what they want. Okay, But they're kicking against what is being imposed on them. I think that's the the reason there that's important to sort of follow. And Dami is really a fascinating character. And I mean, Narancha just mentioned something that I really haven't thought about. And actually, you know, is is she living a sort of uh, escape with Achilles? I mean, as the space where she, like him, are finding a respite from the obligation of the world. And the one thing that really strikes me about this play, and I don't know what to do with this, is when Aran when uh, Arancho, <laughs> De Damia, tells uh, tells Achilles De Damia, tells Achilles. I don't know how to pronounce it, guys. It's Spanish. Uh, De Damia, De Damia. Uh, when when De Damia tells Achilles, you know, um, it's good that you come you come dressed like a man because if you came dressed like a woman, your desire will be violent. She said, yeah. "What? What?" <laughs> What the hell is going on there? I mean, it's sort of you know, it's such a such you know, this queer desire that she has. It's just like yeah. amazing. Um, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm left speechless because I really do not know how to unpack that. Well, I mean, but I actually did a good job of sort of pointing that out. I think. And, and I think that what I liked about it is it's totally believable that they may go off together as either you know man and man man and woman woman and woman it really doesn't matter right it sort of breaks that mold and i think on a stage where you have actors cross dressing playing different roles it would make it even more sort of bewildering and really yeah. think about you know the, the allegories you mentioned and so and to and to add to it so de to me what makes what i think makes this play a little more interesting is she's not just a um uh you know two dimensional character right mm -hmm. she develops too she has desires that I think, you know, it's more subtle, but it comes through pretty powerfully. Um, and so this play, you know, the two of you are, are powerful figures in the play. You're, you're exploring your desires, your reason. Um, but part of what also makes it work is, is the cast around you. So I'd like to bring a couple of them in there. I think I'll start with, with Hugo as Ulysses. Um, so I think, you know, it's hard in any performance to be sort of a you know, the secondary roles that keep the engine running, but even more so in sort of a Zoom environment where you're like, you're on and you're off. Um, so Hugo, uh, what what did you bring sort of mentally to this space to, to stay engaged? Um, and where did you see your role in the performance? Well, I think uh, in my case, the character was very straightforward and the objective was very clear in comparison to the, like all the complexity that the, my, like Arancha and Lisbeth had, Uh, for me, it was just okay. This is the objective of the of the character, and just uh, try to keep the atmosphere of the play. Whenever you're in, try to keep the atmosphere going on with with the presence of these of this character. But also, I think it's interesting to have a, a character who manipulates, uh, for example, Achilles in the in the last uh, scene, where he is just like, "Yeah, too bad you're not the person I I, I thought you were," and that. I think that moves the entire story, uh, so that so that Achilles takes a, a different perspective of what what was going on. So I think it's all the secondary characters are are very interesting to play. Uh, but I was just like a side note. I was in love watching Aranzas and Lisbeth work because yeah. it was just like okay, I'm really inside this play, uh, like as as a viewer as well as a character. So it was really really cool to do it. And I think anytime someone gets to be Ulysses, there's always an extent to which the audience is waiting for him to do something kind of skeevy, right? Mm -hmm. Or kind of underhanded. Um, and so I kept wondering, like, because I don't know the play well, right? When you, every time you came in, I was like, all right, is it now? Right? Mm -hmm. Is it time? Um, so again, you know, bravo bringing that together. Um, and so for, for the next one, Alejandro, um, one of the things that Carlos mentioned was um, the different language that comes to bear in this play. 
right? Uh, and you as the king, you have to be pompous, you have to hold it together in a similar way that Ulysses does, but you move the plot aside. Um, how did you find dealing with the language as it moved from sort of like one tone and one um, paradigm to another? Well, um, it was not difficult at all. I think that the translation was pretty clear and uh, the line in which the, the play is going, it really helps everyone to find out what's going on with the story. Um, so I and think language was not a, a, a barrier for, for us. I think we need to, I'd like to acknowledge the translator, um, Karadat Svich, for, for sharing the work with us, which is, I love that we get to play with all these different translations and bring different types of language to bear. Um, but so your role as the king, I found it, uh, Alejandro, sort of surprising at the end when the king's just like, well, you know, I, I, I'm giving up. I, how, what do you feel is the emotional arc of that character in this play? Well, um, from the beginning, the whole, all the lines of the king, they make references to the gods. Mm -hmm. So he's very respectful of what the gods have, you know, what they decide. He mentions Mars. And then at the, at the very end, when he hears Tete's voice, he has nothing to do but surrender. And actually the last lines are more like he's in like into a trance. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, just obeying what the goddess have, uh, you know, put into this path. So uh, he is, he, as you say, he's a mighty king, but he's very respectful of what the gods have to, to say about, you know, everything. Um, and, and, you know, I think, I think the, the, you mentioned it as a trance at the end that really came off well. Um, and really, really, Thetis came in and we got you know, transported to this different space. Um, so, you know, a couple more of you are left, haven't gotten to Aldo yet as the, um, you know, as the, the lover, or sorry, the, the betrothed. Um, right. So, uh, although, yeah, Francisco, did you have a question for him? The one thing that I wanted to add, Lidoro is the third, the third very interesting character of this play. I mean, he's the first one that appeared, and he's another one who's in disguise, and another one of the lover who's trying to find his way through this very confusing world of appearances, I think. So he's, he's central also for the relationship between Achilles and, uh, and De Damia. So we'd like to hear what he has to say about the character. Absolutely, because I think my, my view goes towards the characters I know, right? But Lodoro is the one I don't know. So, so Aldo, what, what do you see as, as your character's role in the play um, and how, how did you inhabit it? Well, the way I, I, I saw it, saw the character is like the, this uh, hopeless romantic who um, uh, somehow has a, a, a difficult way to enter the place, well, to the, the island. And he, he has a very clear objective, which is get to De Damias, right? But, you know, he, he somehow like, um, like difficult the way because he, he, he just uh, uses uh, these guys just to approach on the first instance to De Damias. And like, he complicates it all, like, you know, like all the hopeless romantics in somehow like plays like back in Shakespeare's and, and other plays in, in, in Calderon's plays, right? So somehow I, I enjoyed like how, how uh, well, Carlos like directed me on that way, like just like somehow use the comic relief along with Yera with, in Livio to know, you know, um, complement this idea of, uh, of how these uh, ro hopeless romantic, these prince, this uh, and his sidekick, you know, uh, tried to get to the to the girl, you know. Uh, so somehow I, I just just looked it look it up like that. And and you brought in so these elements of different genre that we were talking about, some of the romance, some of the uh, new comedy, um, and then Lara, as as Aldo just said, um, you brought in some different things in the play. What did you see your roles in the play as sort of carrying out and, and contributing? Sorry, Lara. Yara. Oh, Yara, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm trolling. And I'm probably, it's okay. Uh, it was a really good project. Uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated with all the people here. Um, it was a really good work with Aldo in this comedy relief. And um, it was really funny. My character, um, Livio, it was the, the, um, the way to, we tried to get in the, in the play, it was 
like if they're funny, the dumb character. It was amazing. Um, I, I, I love to uh, watch uh, uh, Arancha and Liz playing as, as Achilles and Deida Mia. It was amazing. Thanks, Carlos, for, for having us here. You all guys, thank you so much, really. I appreciate it so much. And one of the things I really like about um, Yara and Eldo, what you broke, both brought to the small screen was a lot of energy, right? Like there, there was a little bit of menace there um, and it's really hard to sort of do that in, in the space. So I, I appreciate that. Um, so a couple more comments before we close. So, so Emma, um, you know, what did you do this week to make this all happen, right? And how were you engaged with this work? Uh, well, Carlos and I were kind of collaborating a little bit on the adaptation process. We've had some conversations early on in the process, had some conversations with actors. I was lucky enough to be able to sit in on rehearsal. Um, I was kind of, uh, I guess unofficially on this, the kind of queer consultant. Um, as for when I was reading this play to begin with, the thing that really struck me, especially about the kind of tension between, uh, not between, within Achilles, um, particularly in the moment of seeing the Damia, there's a concept that kind of gets thrown around in, in queer circles a lot about gender envy um, and seeing the tension between desire for another person in a romantic or sexual context and desire for what that person represents for the self. So it's really, it was really, really interesting to me. And Elizabeth did an amazing job and we had some very fun conversations about it watching this version of Achilles kind of construct his own identity based off of this kind of revelation of femininity, like, oh, like because he doesn't know that it exists in this particular framing of the myth where he is raised on Skiros basically in isolation. Um, so it was really, really fascinating to watch that construction of gender happen over the course of the play and to watch this like really radical end of the play where the identity that Achilles chooses isn't chooses and constructs for himself isn't necessarily falling particularly on one side or another isn't particular is is a very queer identity that's constructed at the end because it is kind of forcefully unhooked from the kind of binding of masculinity to violence yeah. um which I think was really really cool to watch yeah I'm 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 all here for kind of queer queer non-binary Achilles constructing his, their own identity through the course of this play. Well, and I think, and that came out really, really clearly. And I think when I was mentioning to Francisco earlier, that felt so like modern and urgent, right? Um, I, 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 I'm, I would not be surprised to see this play perform more. I mean, what do you think, Francisco? Uh, definitely, I definitely wanted to see <laughs> to see it before more. Uh, the point here, I think, the reason why it connects so much with uh, modernity or to for our own time is because these things that em, that Emma is talking about um, are done through the theme of jealousy, mm -hmm. and uh, who hasn't been jealous in their life of somebody else? And it's always a projection of somebody else's desire to something else that you begin to feel these things. You begin to burn, like Achilles says in the play, without even knowing what that burning is. You know, uh, so. I'll, that'll be, I mean, that's one of the elements that makes it sort of speak to us still, you know? Yeah. And it's a very important thing in Calderon as well. Well, I want to thank everyone for, for being with us today. I mean, this is really just, just riveting and exciting. Uh, as we close, Paul, we, do you want to join us and let everybody know when they'll be seeing us again and what some of our plans are? Um, yeah. I, I, and I just want to start off by echoing what you just said and saying a huge thank you to everyone um a big thank you to carlos for putting up with me sort of emailing him with loads of annoying requests as well so um thank you um all of you so much and a big thank you to Fran uh, francisco as well for suggesting this play in the first place um which was uh, really really wonderful um we um are taking a little break um, before our next episode so our next episode will be in September, if you can possibly wait that long, um, when we'll be back um, uh, reading a new play based on some fragments. And that will be followed in October by a highly musical and dance-tastic mm -hmm. version of The Back Eye, um, which we'll be doing in the middle of October. So that's really, really exciting. In, in the meantime, though, we um, there are um, a couple of other things that are still going on. Um, we, be, there's an event on June the 11th, which is a Friday, 
um, and it's an um, event that is sponsored by Torch, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, um, who have supported us as we sort of make our first masterclass video, which is sort of looking at Greek tragedy and particular scenes in rehearsal and looking at the process of rehearsal and what it sort of brings to light about tragedy and performance. Um, so our very first version of that is going to be coming on the 11th of June and there's a live stream of that um, that is happening, I think, at, I think at 5 p.m. Um, British summertime. Um, and in connection to that as well, um, we have just now launched a fundraising campaign to start getting the funds together to create some more of these masterclass videos, which we want to make freely available to anyone who would like to access them in the same way that we've, um, um, all of us kind of created these now 45 episodes of Really Quick Tragedy Online, um, and they're all obviously totally freely available. We now want to make these sort of specific um, masterclass videos available freely to everyone as well. So there is a fundraiser link, which will be um, somewhere on the YouTube page that you are looking at right now, either underneath me or to the side of me or that side of me somewhere. Um, uh, so please do kind of consider um, visiting that page and contributing if you've enjoyed um, what we've been doing during this season and would like to see more of it. Um, uh, there's going to be another outreach competition coming soon but also be able to announce some winners from the Italian um, competitions for the play Medea um, soon um, and there will be news about a podcast coming in the autumn or the fall depending on um, how you like to think of that time of the year um, and I think that just about covers it so thank you uh, again to everyone um, and yeah we hope to see you all again soon. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I'd like you to know that it's 90 degrees here, so your sweater is making me feel even hotter. Um, so please stop. Uh, as the summer goes on, if you guys, if everybody misses us, there are the 40 plus episodes from last year and beyond. Um, and, you know, please reach out if you want to hear more and learn more about what we're doing. I don't want to close without thanking everybody. Francisco for being here today. Carlos for putting this together. Love seeing you again. Our crew that makes this possible. Emma, Lana, John Coley for making the poster images, um, Ali for putting them all together, our great crew of uh, producers, Ellen, Janet, Sarah, um, everybody who's been making, helping us do this for over a year now. Um, so thank you all. Stay safe. Get vaccinated if you, ha if you haven't. Um, and, you know, get back out in the world and do some good. Thank you. <laughs>